Here we've got five Excel tips to help you CAT students for your PRAC exam. And this is to do with the spreadsheet question. Excel tip number one, let's look at the mark allocation. That's going to guide you about what the potential answer is. Normally when you've got a function that you need to use for a question, they allocate a mark for the function name and then they allocate marks for the function arguments. In this case, accountive has two arguments. So accountive question tends to be about three marks. So if we look at a question like this, where we insert a function for two marks, then we're looking at a function with just one argument. And some examples of those include your sum, your average, your max, your min, your mode. If they ask you for three marks for a function, then you're looking at a function with potentially two arguments. So those could be your count if, your small, your large, your left, your right, or your rand between functions. And if they ask for four marks for a function, then you're looking at a sum if, an if, a mid, which tend to have three arguments. You can really narrow down what function they're looking for based on the number of marks for the question. If the question has more than four marks, then you can look at the really big functions like, for example, your sum ifs, your count ifs, your lookups, and your nested if. But don't forget, it's possible that they give you a lot of marks for a simple function by asking you for extra stuff. So, for example, in this case, the average function only needs two marks, one for the name of the function and one for the argument. But this could be a four-mark question because they're also asking you to round it. So they could be asking for extra stuff. And also remember, they won't allocate a mark for the name of the function if they tell you that in the question. For example, if they say use the average function to determine, then they won't give you a mark for the function name. So Excel tip number two, what's the difference between a criteria and a logical test? A criteria is something that you often come across in account if that thing at the end there, that tends to be a criteria that we use for a range of cells. And it follows the following format. You normally have an operator. Now your different operators tend to be a greater than, less than, greater than or equal to, less than, equal to. Remember with those two, you do them as you say them, greater than, equal to. Don't do the equal to signs first and then the greater than symbol. It's first greater than or equal to. So it's in that order. Less than or equal to. Then you've got your equal to symbol. Take note, you don't actually have to use the equal to symbol in a criteria. You can just say 30 and it will be the same as saying equal 30. And then don't forget the opposite of equal is not equal to, which is that symbol there. Shine bright like a diamond. The less than symbol followed by the greater than symbol. So just remember Rihanna whenever you want to do not equal to. Shine bright like a diamond. And then after your operator, you have the value that you want to refer to. So it's greater than 30. So you're looking for all the values in the range that have the criteria greater than 30. And your criteria must always be in double quotes. Don't forget the double quotes. It won't work unless you use your double quotes. So we know that we use criteria in account if, but you might also use them in, for example, a sum if, account ifs, or sum ifs. So those are places where you would use a criteria. Now, a logical test is often used in an if statement, and it's that first part of the if statement that you can look at and you can say yes or no to that question. You can say true or false to, by looking just at the logical test. With a criteria, we couldn't tell if it was true or not. We had to look at the range as well. But with a logical test, you can look at just that argument and say that is true or that is false. And it follows the following format. You first of all going to have a cell followed by an operator very similar to what we had with the criteria criteria, same operators there, so not equal to, greater than, equal to, and so on, and then a value. And by looking at we can say yes or no to that particular logical test. Is that cell greater than that value? But actually, we don't have to just use values. We could actually use a cell in this place as well. We could say if a cell is greater than another cell, we could say that a cell is greater than a particular formula or function. And in fact, that first part, the cell part in the very beginning, that could also be a cell or a formula if you wanted to. Just remember that unlike a criteria, you do not use double quotes with a logical test. If we, for example, used a formula, we could say the sum of B4 to B8 is greater than 30. And there we can see if that is true or false. Now, if you take a logical test and you put it straight into a cell with an equal to sign, so we're not even using the if statement there, you just put the logical test in as it is with an equal to sign at the front, that's going to return a true or a false into that cell. So that you can use it as a way to ask that question and see if it is true or false. Now, Excel tip number three, we're dealing with absolute referencing. Now, if you remember your formulas, if you copy your formula down, you'll notice that the numbers change. 
If you copy the cells down, the numbers will increase. If you copy the cells up, the numbers will decrease. And if you copy across, you'll notice that the letters change to the next sequence of letters. If you copy it to the right, and if you go back to the left, it'll go back in sequence. That's what happens when you copy formulas. Now, there might be times when you want to copy a formula, but when you copy it down, you want the one part of the formula to change as it always does when you copy it, but you want the other part to stay the same. In this case, you want B4 to change to B5, but you want D1 to remain the same. If that's the case, then we're going to press that F4 key on that D1. So you make sure that your cursor is on D1, press F4, and it will put dollar symbols around it. And those dollar symbols will lock that cell. Now, if I take this scenario, you'll see that there's a big problem with those total values in the E column. That's because we use the formula equals D4 plus E1. If I copy that down, I want the D4 to become D5 and D6, but I don't want that E1 to change. It must always refer to E1. If I want to copy that down and have the correct values, I'm going to need to put dollar signs around the E1 by pressing that F4 key. And if I do that, you'll get better results. The rule I basically use is whenever I'm using data, that's in a table like this. You'll see that all your calculations and all your values are in a nice little laid out table. The moment you are referring to a cell that's outside of that table, do you see how delivery cost is outside of where the main information is? The moment that happens, you are probably going to need to use absolute cell referencing for anything that's outside of your actual table of data. Now, Excel tip number four is when you are using a nested F, you normally get three options. You need to have a logical test. So which one do we use? Well, I always ignore the middle one. That is the most difficult one to do a logical test for. I rather prefer to use either the top one or the bottom one. So let's take the top one, for example. If D6 is less than equal to 150, that one covers the bottom one. So if that's true, then we're going to make it bronze. Then if it's false, we then go to our second if statement, which will have its own logical test. This is why it's nested, because it's inside of the other if statements. Now for this logical test, again, I ignore the middle and I rather move to the final option. So as I said, ignore the middle, do the top one or the bottom one. And this logical test, I'm going to say D6 is greater than 250. It's a lot easier to work out the bottom and the top options. The middle one's normally the most difficult one. If that value is more than 250, then we're going to get the gold as our answer. And if it's neither the bottom and neither the top one, then it must be the middle one. So I don't even need to check if it's between 151 and 250. I just know if it's not the first one and it's not the last option, and then it must be the middle option. So my advice for you is to always use the top one or the bottom one whenever you are doing your logical tests for your nested if so that you are referring to the middle one last. And then tip number five is to do with your V lookups or your H lookups. Now the basic structure of a V lookup starts off with a lookup value. What value are you looking up? So you might have a table of values that you want to refer to, but you're not actually looking there. You're looking at another value that you want to look and see where it fits inside of the table. So in this case, we are looking for team four, which is stored in E5. That's our lookup value. We are looking for where that four fits in the table. So we're not looking at the table. We're looking at the lookup value. Then we're going to look at our table of possible values. And that normally has a whole bunch of options. And we start Start off with our first cell referencing referring to the top left corner but we do not include the headings so top left corner without the headings and the second value equals to the bottom right corner and that's how we get our cell range with the colon between a lot of times they ask this question they put the table on a different worksheet. If that's the case, then you must make sure that we are referring to the worksheet name followed by the range. And that's normally the worksheet name with an exclamation mark. And you normally get this just by clicking on the table and selecting the right values. But here's a piece of advice. 99.9% .9 of the time when you are copying a V lookup or an H lookup, you do not want that table to change. That table is never changing. It's not moving, which means you're going to need to use absolute cell referencing for your table. So make sure that your table always uses absolute cell referencing when you are using it. So press that F4 button around your different cells so that you can put the dollar signs there. And then the next argument is going to be the column number that you are looking at. So if you look at our table, column one is the team name, column two is the code, and column three is the venue. So you put in the number of the column where you want to get your data. We want the venue in this case. That's why we put a three. 
So remember, this is just the number of the column of the data that you want. I want the venue that is in column three. And then the final argument there that you see is true is actually the range lookup. Now it can be either true or false. If it's true, then it's looking for the closest match. It doesn't have to be exactly, it just has to be close enough and it'll get that closest match value. If you're dealing with finding the closest match, you actually don't even need to put in the true. You can leave it out. You can close your brackets there straight after the three and not even include the true and it will work. However, there are going to be times when you need it to be false. In other words, you need it to be an exact match. My rules for when it's an exact match is when the data is not sorted. So for example, if the team numbers there you can see are not sorted, if that's the case, the VLOOKUP will not work unless it's looking for an exact match. So if you look for team four, it needs to know that it's an exact match to find it. Another option would be if the data is text and you want it as it is. So we want to make sure that we get the actual green team, then you can use a false to find an exact match. So those are the two cases that I tend to use the false argument in my VLOOKUP or HLOOKUP. So let's recap quickly. Remember to look at the mark allocations to help guide you about which function you should be using. Know the difference between a criteria and a logic test. Your, your criteria must always have double quotes. I must be able to look at your logical test and say yes or no, true or false to it. Absolute cell referencing, whenever you're referring to data outside of your table of data, you're normally going to use absolute cell referencing. In a nested if, remember to start with either the first option or the last option and leave the middle option for last. And then with the lookups, make sure that you are following all those parameters. Remember to use the false argument at the end, only if you're dealing with data that's not sorted or if you're looking for a particular type of text. So there we go. There's some five tips that can hopefully help you for your Excel part of your PRAC exam. Good luck. We have a couple of other videos that can give you some tips for your exam. So make sure that you go to our YouTube channel, click on the subscribe button, leave a like, leave a comment so that you know when we're going to post our next tip. And remember, don't do it the long way. Do it the Mr. Long Way.